In the Wild West world of podcasting, there is one podcast that is authentic and genuine and continues to stand tall in its originality. Based on a passion for his guests, their work, and his love of podcasting, Derek Thomas and Monday Morning Critic Podcast get amazing, diverse, unique guests found nowhere else. They include Hall of Fame athletes, Academy Award winners, Golden Globe winners, Super Bowl champions, Emmy winners, award-winning authors, award-winning film score composers, directors, trailblazers, pioneers, and inventors, the variety and quality are endless. There is something for everyone. Derek Thomas is the hero you deserve. He's a silent guardian, a watchful protector. Welcome to Monday Morning Critic Podcast. Here is Derek Thomas. The court accepts the existence of God every time a witness swears to tell the truth. I think it's about time they accept the existence of the devil. You okay there? Jesus. I think I hurt someone. In 1981, Arnie Johnson pled not guilty. We think this family was cursed. By reason of demonic possession. I am not going before a grand jury and saying he was possessed by demons. Whatever happened that day, that was not Arnie. Color me your color, darling. Eugenie Bondurant is a wonderfully talented actor and certainly accomplished. I am so lucky to have her on the show today. She's been in Hunger Games 2, Fight Club, Star Trek The Next Generation, and the absolutely phenomenal The Conjuring 3, The Devil Made Me Do It. Eugenie, welcome so much to the show today. Hi, Derek. Thank you so very much for inviting me. I so, appreciate it. Yeah, so I'm going to go out of order today. This is where I'm coming from and how much your performance meant to me. So my dad and I, we bonded to, like, he passed, but he loved The Conjuring. And this would have been the only oh. one he didn't see. And, oh, oh, yeah. Oh. But but I have to tell you, I have to tell you, if, 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 he knew, if he saw what I saw, because I texted my wife when I got out of the theater, I go, I can't stop crying. Like, I mean, the movie has a lot of heart. I feel like it's horror with heart, this movie. And, yes, that's and, a great way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like your performance added so much to that. And I knew if he saw it, like I feel like in a cheesy, and this is so over the top what I'm about to say, like I feel like I was kind of watching the movie for the both of us. And if he saw right. what I saw, I think he would have loved you and loved this yeah. movie. So I'm going out of order here. So thank you for that. Oh, well, oh my gosh. I, 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 I'm glad I can contribute a small part of that. How wonderful though, you know, seeing it for him and seeing it, you know, in some senses of the word with him, if we can allow ourselves to say that. Mm, mm, well, you know, well said. And, you know, let's start at the beginning because I really love your life here. I really love where, where you go here. You're, you're a NOLA, um, right? How many years were you in uh, New Orleans for uh, Eugenie? So I was born and raised in New Orleans. And uh, let's see, I was there until I was 17. And then I went to college um, and graduated from college and moved back for a couple of years and then, uh, moved away. So, uh, moved up to New York and had a bout with cancer in between all that, got a real job, had a bout with cancer, you know, got my sword out and rawr, attacked the beast. And then, um, yeah, said, hello, New York. <laughs> and you know, hello, Europe and hello, wherever. Yeah, yeah. and, and fi- I want to say your your family roots in New Orleans are pretty deep. I want to say five or six generations. Is that somewhat- absolutely yes, yes, yes. 
So, we are, you know, you still want to call, we, we, I still call myself an immigrant because my family, you know, we're all, in, we're all Americans, we're all immigrants, unless you're indigenous, you're, um, unless you're American Indian and, you know, and you, you, you're here and this is your country and anyway, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's here? Let's see. Who's here first? How many generations, five generations back, I believe it is. Yeah. So. Yeah, <laughs> pretty impressive. Uh, let me. A- any dirty looks when you choose uh, University of Alabama over Tulane? Oh well, no, really. I would have gotten the dirty looks if I would have chosen LSU over Tulane. Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. You are correct. You are See, correct. And I actually was considering Tulane, but it was in my hometown. So, uh, and my mom and dad met at the University of Alabama. So, I mean, what do you do? You got to go, uh, you know, roll tide. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, living in Massachusetts, I mean, the Patriots seem to love players from Alabama. So I can't, I can't argue that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, so you live that nine to five grind, you know, uh, majoring in <laughs> finance. Uh, was it, was it a grind for you? Were you at the point where you were like, you know what, not enough is enough, but you know what? I Bigger and better things maybe. Was that ever a, a, um, a mentality on your part? Very interesting that you ask. Um, I think there was something in the back of my mind that this it didn't really sit right. So, but what, instead of going into finance, which really I felt like I was pushing away. Honestly, the only reason why I went into finance in the first place, A, I love numbers. Um, not that I do anything with that now, but um, uh, I went into finance because that's where all the cute boys were. <laughs> so, you know, I went, oh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, finance, they'll think I'm smart. So, then when I, you know, I moved back to New Orleans, I wasn't at that point interested in going back and getting my master's. I would have gone to get my master's if it was in the arts, but that was not part of the mindset of my family and what their intentions were of me or what the expectations were. So uh, I came back home and I ended up getting a job that was not really so much of a grind. I leased office space, or at least I attempted to do that. And um, that was kind of fun. I mean, I had a pretty much flexible schedule. So that has been where I've been living in that life of the flexible schedule and working very hard when I'm, you know, when I'm most of the time, actually, I'm working a lot of the time, whether it's, you know, obviously not office leasing, but whether it's teaching or acting or right. coaching or whatever else. Yeah. You, you are certainly a, um, a jack of all trades and, 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 re- and you do it really well. Um, but before I get on to like what you've been doing and kind of the current state of things, tell me about this household when you're growing up, right? The youngest of three girls, mom, super creative. I know yeah. from, from what I've seen, you really, really admire her. Um, talk to me about that. Um, she was a very interesting woman uh, growing up with her. I had uh, very interesting parents. Uh, you know, my dad was from Alabama. My mother was a native New Orleanian and very staunch New Orleans and, you know, traditional New Orleans. So, um, was a great cook. She knit, she was, uh, she sewed, she, um, she was a jack of all trades. And I think that's how we all three got it. She, uh, when my sisters were growing up, I'm the youngest. So they, you know, she was, uh, the girls, girl scout leader and that kind of stuff. So you can't help. It rubs right off on you, you know, that, that environment. So it was fun. I mean, I, I, you know, honestly, when we bought our house, my husband and I bought this house it needed a lot of love and care. It's a hundred years old, and that doesn't sound old to someone in Massachusetts. But here, in, in where I live, it's very old, considered very old, and it, it needed a lot of work. And my husband was the one going to work, and I was the one at home working on the house. And it's all from my mom. I got that from her. Hmm. And my dad too, but really my mother. Now I, I, I don't know if you're bounce. Many actors I interview bounce around from location to location, but I think your permanent residence is in Florida. Is that yes? Um, huge race fan. Yeah, go raise, raise <laughs> up. They're doing really well. They are. Yeah. And, and, and oh, you know what they do really well too, uh, Eugenie, is that they've laid the the floor plan for how you run a franchise, right? So they let good players go and somehow fulfill fulfill those spots with or fill those spots with players that are equal. It's just amazing how they do things. Unbelievable! On that little bitty budget, they managed to do that, and 
the Rays, all the Rays love working there and they love, they love the team. And, you know, I do too. Uh, it's the scrappy team that's done so well. And oh, I love going to race games. It's really an enjoyable experience. And I did not, I was not a baseball fan before I met my husband. So there it is. That was born out of Tampa Bay. How do you get to the point where, because one of the things I don't want to leave out is that you did teach acting for, for a large part of your life. Um, still do. Yeah, still do. And, and how do you get to that point? Like where, where does that come from? Where does your, your theatrical, because we, we talk, you know, um, Roll Tide, we talk finance, but how do we go from there to acting and then teaching acting? Do you want the long version or the short version? I want the version you want to tell me. I am so open to anything you want to tell me. <laughs> that that is such a good answer. Wow, wow! Thank you. Yeah, um, okay, so uh, you know when I when I moved to New York, I was um, modeling. I was scouted, and um, I worked in Paris and in New York and Germany and uh, doing runway. And at some point, I met a guy. It's always like that, you know, it's always a romance. Uh, I met a guy, and when I was in Paris doing Pret-a-Porter, he moved to Los Angeles. So he, you know, calls me in Paris. It was back 100 years ago. Calls me in Paris. Hey, why don't you come out and visit? I said, jokingly, send me a plane ticket. He did. So long story short, a year later, I, while I was about that, I, you know, and I ended up staying there for a year. A year later, as I was breaking up with him, I thought, I've got to figure this out. Los Angeles, runway modeling, my look, I do not go together. So I've got to figure out something else to do. So I went, uh, I thought, okay, I'm not getting into finance. That's no way. I'm not doing that. And it's been so many years. I've been so many years out. That's not, I, I, can't, I can't, I'm not that person anymore. So, uh, I went to this school in Beverly Hills, not a school, not a traditional school, but like an acting school. And I said, do you teach modeling? And if you do, I'll be your teacher. And I thought, I can't believe I'm actually saying that. Why do people <laughs> need a teacher to teach them how to, how to model? But I did need a job. And um, even though I had representation there, um, I needed, you know, it looked like I was staying. My sister lives there and, um, and I was staying and her kids were there and I, I wanted to be near her. So, um, they did start, <laughs> they needed someone like me. So they brought me on. And then, uh, like I said, I'd been auditioning for commercials and didn't really know what I was doing, but I was booking. So they, they, they also had this acting, uh, commercial acting program. And so I was, you know, I got a mentor there and he taught me how to teach that. So I started teaching that. And then I realized, oh my gosh, wait a second. I'm now auditioning for, for, you know, film and television stuff like one liners. I was going from the modeling career into, you know, oh, hire the model you know, models don't know how to walk and talk. Well, I thought, well, I do, but I don't know what I'm doing in that world. So anyway, um, long story short, I ended up taking acting classes and got an acting coach and then, you know, got some traction underneath and, uh, then, you know, worked quite a bit teaching and teaching commercial acting. And then that turned into, uh, you know, scene study, et cetera, et cetera. And I had a really great group of people around me who um, we all supported each other. We were all teaching together. We were, were all actors and all rooted for each other. So you, you got to, you know, I tell my actors now, find your people, find your group, find the people that, you know, that support you. Aside from me, because I will support you you know, uh, until the cows come home, but you need people around you to do that. So. Yeah. I was just going to ask you if you, if there was one point you could hammer home to your students and I think I got my answer. Is there a pet peeve you have as a teacher of acting? Is there something that I don't want to say bothers you, but that you wish you could correct or that wish you wish you could um, convey to your students? Is there something that, that, that stands out or is it, do you feel like every student is very unique and brings their own set of, you know, different and unique um, circumstances? Okay, the thing that bothers me is actors need to know how to read. <laughs> <laughs> there are usually instructions. And 
if you don't know how to read instructions and you don't have good actor's etiquette, then guess what? When you go on set, your that's that your 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 career is going to be short lived because if you don't know how to read a call sheet or you don't know how to respond to an email when an agent sends you a request for an audition and you have until a certain day to turn it in, well, guess what? You're not going to go very far. Mm. So that bothers me. That, um, yeah. yeah, that is such a great point. And, and I've asked this question to other actors that, that, that teach. And I got to say, that is the most unique, I would say beneficial answer if I was listening to it. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's all about reading and it's about emailing. Like, people yeah. do judge you on your grammar when it comes to emails, your grammar when it comes to responding to them. You're, you know, just having a conversation. Many of the uh, auditions are done via, you know, um, you know, video. So that video. goes, yeah, you, that, what you just said goes a long way. If I'm an actor, I'm listening to this. I, I, I'm listening to that advice. Well, okay. I, I, I actually had one of my actors come to me today and we did a self tape, like what you were talking about. And I, said, okay, let's see what we're supposed to do here for the slate. Well, I've worked with that casting director. I've taped a number of her, um, a number of people is submitting to her, and I kind of know what she wants by this time, but it changes. And, you know, it's not surprising for me to read the instructions three or more times because it is very important when those casting directors get, especially when you're in the Southeast, when they get those files in front of them, if you've got a, a labeling issue, you've missed, mislabeled something, then guess what? Your audition is going in the trash. Mm. And that is the first thing to be able to open that door for work. Um, there are a lot of people who are too big and you know, have, don't make choices and yada, yada, yada. That I can work on. What I can't work on is the other stuff, you know, the agent communication. Um, I can tell people until they're blue in the face, but if they don't agent their agent or manage their agent or help their agent out or treat people with respect, I can't, they're not going to end up working. Mm. So you want to work, you got to follow directions. You know, you need to know how to read. No, that, that's no. It, it's it sounds basic, but it the way you kind of elaborate on that, it is so well said. And something you said earlier, and I can't go past this because I think it's a big part of your life. You, yeah. you mentioned that in mid twenties you had cancer. It was non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, yes. I can't imagine how difficult that journey was for you. And I know you've said this in other interviews, so I'm not you know bringing up things that you haven't said before. Um, it, oh, I'm talking about it. Okay, good. And, and you've. You, 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 You've mentioned how it changed your appearance and metabolism, and those changes created new opportunities. And I feel ridiculous asking you this, but <laughs> is there a way that some positive came from this experience for you? And I feel so stupid saying, no, no, you know, no. positives came from cancer because I just I feel ridiculous listening to those words come out of my mouth. But if you could correct me or, or just elaborate on what I what, what I just said, you know, first of all, I I really appreciate you asking that, and you're very kind for even saying that. I don't mind talking about it. Um, I'm just going to speak the truth from my point of view and my perspective. Um, as a cancer survivor, I do want to talk about things like that. I do want to talk to other people. If somebody's had cancer, I feel like, oh my gosh, okay, you're in this fraternity that you didn't choose, but. I'm, I'm an alum of that. And, you know, let's talk if you want, if you're ready to talk. Uh, and, and I know that there are several people, I mean, a lot of people who are in that same group want, don't mind speaking about it. So how it changed my life. Um, you know, I felt like it's the, it's the experience before the diagnosis that was really the tricky part. It was the uh, questioning of what is happening to my body and the misdiagnosis and the, uh, you know, nine months to a year of confusion. Mm. That was the most painful part of it. And I know a lot of people uh, are suff have suffered from things like that. And sometimes they find out it's cancer. Sometimes they find out it's something else. And sometimes it's something innocuous. But it's, it's that living in confusion. So when I uh, was actually diagnosed and the doctor told me what it was, it was almost like um, 
a weight was lifted off of my shoulders and I thought, okay, well, that's a goal. And it was painful to hear. It was uh, a struggle, uh, you know, for about 24 hours. And then I just thought, all right, what's the game plan? But I, in the same token with the struggle, I also felt, um, you know, with the weight being lifted from my shoulders, I felt a freedom of, of life Mm. that, that, uh, I was not boxed in. I was not, um, if I, 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 they figured this out, what this is. Okay, then. So what do I want to do? And, 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 and what's stopping me from doing what I want, you know, following this other journey and, and what is it that I need to do? And that is the thing that shifted that, that, uh, perspective of, um, of my life. I didn't feel like I, I had to do certain things and live up to certain, um, maybe certain goals I had for myself. I had a freedom, freedom of life, freedom of creativity. And, uh, it really opened up another, another, I don't know, another perspective. Yeah. And that's so well said. And and I, it's just, you know, you mentioned that it changed, you know, the way your appearance in some ways. And, but I almost Mm. feel like the big change was what what you were kind of getting around is, is the way emotionally that you've come out of this thing, right? Like, I feel like that's the freedom and that's the big change. And I feel just hearing you talk is, is pretty inspiring. I have to say. I was very lucky to have a supportive family as well. And also terrific doctors who back then, you know, they supported me as well. I mean, I remember telling my doctor, my uh, oncologist, the month before my last round of chemo, you know, each month I had three rounds. I would go in and two were pretty much kick butt, bad, you know, horrible, knock you out for 24 hours uh, things. And the month before, I looked at him and I said, so in a month, when's my last uh, chemo session? And he said, oh, it should be this time. I said, great. Uh, the next day, I'll be on a plane to New York. And he just, what? <laughs> and I said, no, seriously, you're going to give me a, a you're going to give me dates on when you want to see me. And I will fly back down and I will fulfill the demands of what you are requesting of me. But in the same token, I'm leaving. That's I'm just so awesome. leaving. I need to fly. And I did. It's yeah. fun. And it's been an incredible journey with lots of up, ups and downs and crazy turnarounds and stuff. It's been incredible. I'm so grateful. You know, and I have to say what I love about your career too, you know, as it coincides with your life is, is, is nothing about you is, you know, I interview actors who are wonderful, but many times they take roles that are, you know, it's the angry sheriff, it's the prison card <laughs> prison guard that's abusive it's the same i feel like with you though your roles are so unique very much like your life it's you know you know hunger games 2 tigress you know um yeah. the occultist it's, it's like i love your choices like you don't ever play it safe it's like here i am t- take what you t- this is who i am it's nothing safe and i love that like if if, if i was uh, if i was observing your class or if i was a student in your class that's what i would raise my hand and say like that's what I admire most is you never play it safe. And I think that's to be admired on the highest level. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. I hope that, um, I hope that it, um, that it shows off in the work. Uh, sometimes we, we want to play it safe as an actor because we think, Oh no, no, no. We need to give the, uh, you know, when we're auditioning, we need to give the, uh, production team, the director, what she or he wants. Well, you know, sometimes, I mean, we are, we're ourselves, we're individuals and really that's the thing that makes us shine. So, uh, having that come through is, I think that's, I don't know. I, this is going to sound egotistical, but I think that's what makes me who I am. And, you know, I, I'm an individual. I, I, maybe that's part of what you're seeing. I, I don't not, not egotistical in any way possible. Nope. That, that, that's exactly who you are. And that's, a, that's something to be admired. Not like, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I wanted to, I was thinking about you today. I was doing some research. Um, for those listening, you were in hunger games too. Uh, Tigress, a very unique character. Um, I didn't know if you knew this, but there's a prequel that came out for, for the book. 
And yes. she plays a huge part, I guess. So talk about your experiences in, in Hunger Game 2, what that was like for you. Um, I heard a, or I read a wonderful story where, I mean, you're you're clearly in a, a, a lot of um, cosmetics and, and makeup where you um, you created scarves, you craft scarves for those that helped you get into yes. that makeup. Um, again, like we're talking about who you are and you're not being um, – you know, you're not patting yourself on the back. I'm doing that. Um, oh. But like, what a very kind gesture. Um, talk about that in, in, in your experience on Hunger Games, too. Well, you know, get, we're going to go back to the craft, being crafty again and uh, knitting. You know, we all knitted. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> there's so many incredible, very important people who worked on that. Well, not important, very important. That's the wrong thing to say, but incredibly talented people who worked uh, on that project. And, um, there were several who worked just on my character for that tiny window of time. And I feel like they were so giving and, uh, attentive. And I know that's their job and I know that's what they were hired to do. But for me, it made me feel so, um, supported and special. Mm. So, uh, I want to, I like to in turn, you know, give back to people who give, who've given me things. And, you know, so I, per usual, um, when I was on the set, I remember I was there several days in a row and there were a couple of days that I wasn't working. So I thought I'm missing my knitting. I forgot to bring my knitting up. It's like, dang, dang, dang. And I looked up on the internet and there are these uh, instructions for arm scarves. Like, how do I make an arm scarf? And I thought that would be so much fun. <laughs> so I raced out um, to a knitting, you know, a yarn store and I picked up all this fun yarn and started making these scarves, these, you know, circular scarves. And, and uh, you know, they took just a couple of hours to do. So I would just start, <laughs> I just gave them out. It's it really fun. It's, yeah. They're simple. You know, uh, that, that is, is that a role that's a lot of fun to play? I mean, um, it, it just seemed like it was, you know, it, oh, it, Tigress. Yes. A blast, a blast, a blast. Well, OK, so the first person I met was Glenn Hetrick. Um, and I don't know whether you know him, but he is a master at creatures. So they flew me to Los Angeles and I'm sitting down. At, he you know, I'm looking at his creature shop and I've been in creature shops before. I mean, when I lived in LA, I did several things and, uh, I did one movie where, you know, I, I was completely covered and, you know, stuff, but at any rate, um, he, he says, come into my office. What do you think about Tigress? Who, who is she? And so one thing leads to another. And he said, well, we're going to do a body cast. Have you ever had that done? I said, so do you mean just the head or the full body? Because I've had them both done. And he did a double take. And I, he, he, said, <laughs> he goes, what do you mean you've had them done? I said, well, yeah. I mean, I had a full body, like neck down body cast done by Screaming Mad George. Screaming Mad George! Yeah. Um, when I did, you know, when I was on space truckers, space truckers, you were on space truckers. Oh, uh, Glenn, you know, I was the biomechanical warrior in space truckers and Glenn did the square pigs in space truckers. And I didn't even know him cause we didn't, he was only there for a certain amount of time. So it was so cool. I mean, immediately I thought, this is my guy. This is, this mm, is my guy. Mm. This is my guy. And talk about talent. The guy lives and breathes his talent. He's unbelievable, unbelievable. Mm. So he and Neville Page and V. Neal and Nicoletta Scarlatos, I mean, all of them, whoosh, created this, created this character and were so good to me. <laughs> really nice. Um, and Glenn, I don't know whether you know this, but I have got these whiskers on my face. Yep, yep. Mm. So... He, you know, I've got this prosthetic on my face as well. And then they have to, you know, put the, the tattoos on the prosthetic and then make up my eyes and, you know, put the tattoos all over my arms and so forth and so on. But when, but he designed the prosthetic so that there are these little nibs, um, that, uh, 
that the whiskers could go in and the whiskers, he tried all this stuff. The whiskers, it was either the nibs or the whiskers or maybe both were, you know, airbrush, Mm. the people, the airbrush, that's what it is. It's an airbrush, um, either nib or the whisker. And you couldn't reuse the prosthetic. So they take the prosthetic off at the end of the day and they try to get as many shots as they could with this, right? And then he'd take out the whiskers, and the, you know, and the little nibs. He's like, these are so expensive. And I know the, you know, and they were going to throw away the prosthetic, of course. So anyway, cool people. Really Very fun. cool. And the fact that, that he, to work with them again. Yeah. And huh? the fact that he sought your input speaks volumes yeah. about what kind of person he is. Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Incredible. And, you know, his work being, being in his shop was just, Oh, I, 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 I could stay in here for hours and ask him about every single thing. He is a master craftsman. So as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, you mentioned earlier in the interview about your, your, your runway models, what, what, what the modeling you've done. Um, did that, did the confidence from that, and I assume you have to be confident because I can't even imagine, I mean, I would think that's a very difficult thing to do. <laughs> Did you take anything? And this is—it seems random, but it's not because when you were talking, I'm thinking confidence, and you were talking, you know, the, the, the suit and, and the model. Is there um, is there a part that you took from runway modeling into acting, or is it kind of just completely oh, yeah. separate? It's got to be the conf- it's part of that has to be confidence, right? Am I- absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. You're putting on a shell. Uh, you're putting on. You know, you're, you're, yeah, you know, I, I don't know if they do this now because I'm so far away from modeling now that nowadays I have no idea that all I know is that I'm dancing in the street that, you know, anybody could be a runway model now, you know, tall, short, big, small, whatever color you are, blah, 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 age. Um, I, yeah, I do think it's the confidence. I really do. You know, the confidence you know, as a young girl growing up, I'm, I'm going to just veer away from modeling for a second. As a young girl growing up, I'm six one. So, uh, I was tall at two. Um, mm. I, you know, you double your height when you're two, I was three feet tall and people would interact with me. My sister's telling me that they'd interact with me and I, you know, speak whatever you're speaking at two years old. And, you know, they would look at my mother as if, oh my gosh, something's wrong with this child because they didn't realize I was two years old. Two years old, right, right. Yeah. They thought I was four or five. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> I, at a certain point, you know, when you're in grade school, when you're the tallest person in the class, there you get this inferiority complex. And um, I was dealing with that until uh, it was my first day in ninth grade. And my mother was driving me to school and we pull up, she's about to make the turn in front of the school. And I see this young girl gliding across the street and going into the school. And I thought, oh no, this is exactly what my dad, this is who I am. (laughs) You know, my dad was telling me, I'm going to put you in a back brace. I was hunting over. And from then on, that's where I was. And so the confidence followed me into, um, I feel like it's like this, my security cloak. Right. No, no, that makes that sense. Height yeah. thing. And so the height as being, a, you know, I, I realized early on, okay, you're tall. You're more than likely going to be one of, if not the tallest, then one of the taller, taller people in the room or the tallest in the one of the tallest in the room. And so, give into it and enjoy it and love it and embrace it. And that's that moment watching that girl glide across the street. I went, okay, ding, 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 ding. That's when that happened. So yeah, it does. It followed me through modeling and then it's followed me through, um, you know, through my work with, uh, with Tigris. That was part of it. That, and, you know, bring a little bit of cat mannerisms to that. But, uh, and same with conjuring. Brought, I brought it in there. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, w- and my last question before we get into this wonderful movie that I absolutely love, The Conjuring Three. Yeah. Uh, the Devil Made Me Do It. Um, my last question to you is: I got to tell you, the only issue I have with the Hunger Games is, and 
it breaks my heart. It's not with the Hunger Games, the movie itself. Seeing Philip Seymour Hoffman breaks my heart every time I watch this th- these movies. Not that he was just not only taken that for, from us so young, but he oh. was so. T- I mean, he's like so. It, put it in sports terms, he was probably like um, you know Babe Ruth as far as ability. Yeah. He was that good. He was that good. What a good analogy. He's our Babe Ruth. I know. You know, know. yeah, it's just it's just heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Um, What is not heartbreaking is Mm. the Conjuring Three. The devil made me do it. Boy, do I tell me if you if you're on board with me on this this point of view. Right. So I am a guy that promotes theaters one thousand percent. If I I put a post on Facebook, I said I can watch Conjuring Three right now. I could press play on HBO. I said, but you know what? I will be at the theater tomorrow morning watching this. I feel like all movies should be in a theater. Um, I'm not saying streaming services should not premiere movies. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we should be back in a place where if we release major motion pictures like The Conjuring 3, we should be watching them. And I'm going to tell you right now, the theater was packed when I was there. And this was Saturday. I want to say it was a 1050 show. It was packed. People loved it. Yes. So, I mean – what do you feel about that? Do you, I mean, I have no issues with it because you know the virus has meddled in this. I get it. I completely yeah. get it. What's your take on that? Uh, big big screen. Um, how, how do you feel about that? I love seeing films on a big screen. Oh my gosh! You hear the music. It's you're you're in the journey. It's it's surrounding you, and then if you're really lucky, you have a few friends with you, and then you can enjoy that experience together. Um, like you said, I, you know, I do enjoy going upstairs and snuggling on the couch and watching watching something on TV. Yeah. But, uh, oh, my gosh, there is nothing like seeing a film on the big screen. And I really – whoever is listening, guys, go see it on the big screen. Really, the sound and the music. Joseph Bashara, mm. what – a uh, talent mm-hmm. in music, and you are not going to experience it as you would if you were in the movie theater. It just, mm. it's just, yeah. You know, in the week in the week before, I had saw um, a, a, a Quiet Place too, and John Krasinski comes in after the trailers and says, um, "I really want to say thank you for coming out into the theater mm. and watching this movie because I know you realize." how important it is and the effects of really watching a movie in a theater. Like it was like a sincere thing. It it was a beautiful moment. Like I just wonderful moment for, for, for not just a quiet place too, but for all movies being released. Oh, Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. And a few questions for you here. Um, first off, hang on. Was he in person? No, he he was, no, no, no. He was, um, it, it was like, so after the trailers had played, it's he he's in front of the, the he, he's on screen and oh. he's he's saying you know because he obviously married to Emily Blunt but he's he just said thank you for coming okay. out to the theater and, 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 like and, and, and this wasn't available I don't think on any other networks or streaming services oh, but, but man. like thank you for making the trek to the theater to watch like like <laughs> I don't know like I, I I love people who are passionate about theater so like like I was just so impressed by that. Um, but I want to say to you, uh, thank you for scare, scaring the absolute ever loving hell out of me. Um, so thanks for that. Um, um, talk about, is this a part, so we talked about your unique character choices. Is this, sure. is this more fun to play than, than other parts? Is it more stress? Is it more pressure? You work with some awesome actors, right? Patrick Wilson, uh, Vera, John Noble, who's an absolute freaking legend. Oh. Um, talk about that. Anything you want to throw in there? Anything you want to add yeah. to this? I am all yours. So, um, first of all, what incredible talent. I, I felt like as an actor and as an acting coach, I was taking a master class. And each of mm. the three people that you just named, Vera Farmiga, Patrick Wilson, and John Noble, all three approach it, approach their craft in a slightly different way. So you've got, and, and so that was incredible incredible an incredible experience so i walk in and i you know i know it's one of vera's really heavy emotional days and and she's there and she's fully loaded man you don't you give her her space 
you, you know, respect what she's going through. She gets right there. She's right present. They, he, you know, Shav says rolling and action and bam, she's on like a faucet, like wow. So, uh, uh, Patrick, I'm watching and it's like this, huh? <laughs> you know, Patrick, Patrick, uh, looks at the scene. So there's the blocking. So, so there's Vera holding it back, holding it back. So in rehearsal, Patrick's, Patrick's going through every move. Okay. So, all right. So I see the doors open now. I, and he's saying this out loud. Now, this isn't exactly what he said, but it's, you know, this is how he's speaking, you know. And so I'm, I'm curious why, you know. And then he talks more about the door and, and you know, I, well, I would, I think I would kneel down. So every movement, every line, every uh, gesture is uh, reviewed and questioned, not questioned like, like you would question a, the screenwriter. He didn't do that. But in his mind, that's his way. Uh, one of the ways that he uh, flashes out the scene, okay, and connects himself to the scene. Now, John Noble comes in locked and loaded like Vera, mm. but also <laughs> does the same thing that Patrick does. And so Mike's <laughs> like, whiplash. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Look at you. Wait. Uh, oh, Oh, well, I would say that because, of course, I would say that because, you know, he's justifying this and 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 he's resolving in his mind, which he's done already before. But he's doing that right before the camera rolls. And I thought, wow, this, this is incredible. This experience. So, yeah, it was uh, really fun to 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 go through that. And um, was it difficult? Yeah, it was difficult. Was it a blast? Absolutely. Absolutely. We yeah, and even, and even like a major project like this, uh, Eugenie, is that like you're st- you could tell that you're you're a sincere and you're a legitimate teacher because you're still learning, right? You're a lifelong mm-hmm. learner. Like you're on set and you're watching, and you you know you have your you're clearly very talented in what you do, but you're also kind of watching and observing other. Like I don't know, I just feel like if I was ready to take a class in acting, um, I, I, I'd be all in on you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I love my students. Yeah, and I mentioned, you know, horror with heart. Uh, I got to say, this is a spoiler. So for those of you who are listening, this is definitely a spoiler. Uh, Maybe one of the best screen exits I have ever seen. Who can say they were twisted to death? Cha-ching, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Cha-ching. So when you see the movie, right? So, like, you know, it's obviously shot out of sequence. And I think a lot of people, like, I feel like people that aren't, you know, that invested in movies and theaters as far as how movies are assembled – um, I feel like they don't know that, you know, it's things are shot out of sequence. Um, so the movie, in a way, is it a surprise to you when you see it at the premiere? Is it like, are you caught off guard or are you ever disappointed where like, oh, man, I wish they included this scene? Or are you ever – how does that work for you? Because it's it's new to you too in a way. Yes. It's very new. Sometimes I do miss. Like I – sometimes I am disappointed that, you know, certain scenes weren't, uh, weren't put in and certain – maybe certain uh, clips – of a particular scene that was put in, maybe there was a clip that I, you know, really felt like I connected and, you know, that wasn't one, the one they chose, but we can't, we can't, uh, I can't doubt the editor and the director. I really can't because, you know, they're the ones putting the film together. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I, I think all actors, you know, when they, when they see a project, they're excited to see it and they're excited to see the result. And then there, you know, maybe there's a little question in their minds <laughs> like, Oh, um, now, you know, the ending, believe it or not, we actually shockingly shot close to the ending, which is surprising. Wow. So, yeah. And, um, you know, we had a little bit of additional footage that we had to do, uh, later on and Shavs and I, had worked out via zoom. Um, he had great plans for that ending and he had, uh, several ideas and he, he, he said, how about, I don't know. Wait, should I say exactly what it is? Or, Absolutely. Or? I, I put a spoiler alert out there so people can okay, stop wait. right now and, and they can come um, back and listen after the movie. Stop. Don't listen to what I'm saying. Okay. 
So he said, why do you think about contortion? And I'm thinking, contortion? <laughs> you know, so uh, I said, well, um, what do you mean? And, and then he gave me some ideas and some examples. And so each time that we would get together via Zoom, we would work on certain uh, things that would work and what I actually could do. So looking at that scene, almost every bit of it except for the very, very end where I collapse is me. Wow. Yeah, right? It's pretty crazy. It, they're not, I mean, they obviously, you know, it, when you're filming, you put things together to look a certain way. But all of those movements, um, you know, the arm movements and the falling down and the head and the pull, the arm, you know, and the, the twisting, um, uh, yeah, it's with me. How impressive is that? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think I could do it either. Yeah, and but you did that. Too. Yeah, and, and and there was a twelve year old that did it for David earlier in the in the movie. I was like, "There's no way that your scene and that scene is not CGI." And holy cow, it looks hearing you say that makes it so much more impressive. Oh, thank you. Thank you. When, um, when people see the movie, they'll know exactly what we're saying. Right? I mean, it'll be like <laughs> wow. Like, I mean. Like, how are there not, like, broken bones at this point? Like, I know. <laughs> really? I know. Now, the very, very end, you know, where I collapse, I, I, I couldn't have done that. Right. I, mean, right. I don't know. I couldn't. But, yeah, the rest of the stuff, mm-hmm. And, in fact, when we were working on it, um, Shav sent me a little video, and he said, what do you think of this? And I went, oh, my gosh. It's <laughs> 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 great. <laughs> it's not only a sneak preview. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it worked. It worked out well. That contortion scene in the beginning of the film. Wow. That was all done by the contortionist and they just put, uh, little Rory's head, um, at the end, uh, on, on the, on the, uh, contortionist's head with CGI. Can you believe that? Yeah, I, I mean, mean that just freaks me out. And, and I think when people hear this and they see what we're talking about, um, th- they'll be that much more impressed. You know, and it's it, 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 it taking into account when I say horror with heart, I'm certainly not exaggerating. It's very much hit me like I don't know if you've seen this. It's on Netflix. If you haven't, you and your husband will love this. Haunting of Hill House. Mike Flanagan. Yeah. He did Doctor Sleep. I think this is very much like that in the – you know, I'm not a big horror guy in the sense of a slash him up. Like that's not me. This movie has a plot. It's got heart. Yeah. It's got wonderful acting. Um, my last comment to you before we before I let you go, and you've given me so okay. much of your time. Thank you so much. Um, oh, wait. Pause for a second. Pause for a second. I think yep. I called the little boy Rory. It's actually Julian. My bad. Julian. So that's right. That's right. There's question there. It's yep. Julian, not Rory. Julian. Carrie. Yeah. So I have to say um, – is your husband skeptical when he gets flowers from you at this point? Like, are we, are we taking this to another, to another <laughs> level? I have to promote this movie any way I can, because I love it that much. Like even, even a cheesy dad joke, I'm going to throw it out yeah. there. Well, speaking of flowers, my um, agent and my very good friend sent me flowers and they're dark and they're in this uh, dark vase and it's all this dark stuff. And so I thought, Oh, I'm going to make a little conjuring homage. So, uh, we got holy water as little presents uh, when we wrapped, so I put <laughs> holy water by it. And then um, I also, as a fun thing, put um, these little uh, napkins. I had seen The Conjuring with some friends, and I made these little bags, and I found at the party store uh, napkins with crosses on them. And so I put <laughs> that next to it, and then uh, next to it is – is a uh, is a mouse, you know, a little wooden uh, mouse that I have, and uh, and I thought, oh, this is my little homage, this is my little, you know, conjuring triptych or something like that. <laughs> it's like, it looks so cool. Very anyway. Cool. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Interrupted your flow. You Thank did you. not. And my, my my last comment to you would be: you are a very fun follow on Instagram. You you've displayed some pretty cool artwork of your character, mm-hmm. uh, the occultist. Um, how can people follow you? What are your what are your projects coming up? Anything you want to throw out there? Uh, Eugenie, I am all yours. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. A um, couple of things. First of all, they can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Instagram and Twitter, and I think on TikTok, but I've only put one video up on TikTok. Pretty shameful. Um, <laughs> Euge, E-U-G, 
Bondurant, Yuge Bondurant. And, um, and you can ask Instagram why they're not verifying me as well while they're doing that. Just kidding. Not kidding. Just kidding. Um, and uh, on Facebook, you can follow me, Eugenie Bondurant Actress. Uh, what do I have coming up? There are a couple of things that I can't talk about. Um, there is my school that I'm starting, that I've started. I've got my two in-person classes that are going on right now with a waiting list, which is very cool. I'm thrilled about that. And my husband and I perform together. We do cabaret together. So that's very exciting. Very cool. So and you me. almost sent me off on another tangent with the verification stuff, because if you're not verified, then I don't know. Anyways, like that's, uh, that really makes me angry. Um, mm-hmm. because being in mo- major motion pictures and having significant parts is not enough. I don't, I don't know what they're looking for. Okay. Maybe, maybe you can save the world from, uh, atrocities. <laughs> I don't know at this point, but I have to say you are what my, 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 my dad would have referred to as good people. And I cannot thank you mm-hmm. for being on the podcast today. Well, I, you've been very, very generous, and I truly appreciate your time and you know taking the time to reach out to me. So thank you. 